Um, Richard, you arrive helpfully, so I'm going to give a presentation on your life now. <laughs> this, is, this is going to be the sort of talk about the decision maker's world. So you can now be the canary in the mine and tell me how well or otherwise it, it goes. Um, so I'm Fraser from the Strass Unit. I'll give you, there's a few things to know, I guess, ahead of me just running through my talk. The first is that I'm going to try and provide the context for rapid evaluation from the decision maker perspective. So the world I'm going to be trying to describe is Richard's world. It's the dis local decision maker within the NHS world that will hopefully say something to the rapid evaluator. Um, the title it might be good, it might not be, but it gives everything away. Um, so you... <laughs> Skimming the few words on the screen will tell you basically everything I'm about to say. Um, you'll take it from that. There is no, there's no way in which this is a, this is a, a, a nice, neat story of evidence from the rapid evaluation world landing neatly on the decision-making landing strip and everyone wandering off into the sunset uh, happily together. This is a tale of sort of constraint and of peril and of, and of difficulty. Um, so brace yourself for that. At the end, I'm going to invite you to say, though, how that could be made better, how the situation could be made less perilous and, and more productive and more fruitful. And I'm going to be asking you, on the assumption that your um, evaluation world, what could you do to help improve um, life for decision makers? How can, how can we make things better for them? So that's, that's where I'm going to head with this. Um, I'm going to begin um, uh, really by exposing something about the way the stress unit sees the world, our sort of fundamental purpose, as it were. So we've got a, we've got a core belief that animates basically everything that we do. Um, evaluators will recognize this as a theory of change. So our basic belief um, is that better evidence allied to uh, better decision-making processes, all things equal, really ought to give us better outcomes in the world. So better health outcomes, reductions in health inequality, whatever it might be. That's our sort of core fundamental belief. That's our basic purpose. But when we examined ourselves, um, not that long ago, in light of our sort of core theory, we, we realized the following thing. We'd concentrated, like, I don't know, 99.99% uh, of our efforts on the production of better evidence. And uh, those of you that know the unit will know us for the quality of our analytical stuff, our evaluation stuff, our data science, our strategy work, all of that sort of work. And like... I don't know, for as long as there's breath in the collective stress unit body, we are still going to keep doing that. We aren't going to wander off that uh, particular pitch. So we felt that like we covered off that bit of the equation really quite well. We aren't prepared to look at the bottom bit of the equation. If, I mean, if that basic equation doesn't stack up, we may as well go home. We, we should just retire and find other things to do. So, I mean, if all of this stuff doesn't lead to better outcomes, what business are we in? Um, so it then occurred to us that the limiting factor, the thing that we had just not paid attention to, was the decision-making process in and of itself. Um, it came to me personally in a bit of work we were doing on population health management, where there was all, you know, good feverish talk about the opportunity for analytics and the analytical disciplines and methods and all the rest of it. But it seemed to me that by far the greatest limiting factor was the ability of decision-makers to get the analytical outputs and to do something useful with it. So we've, we've plotted that as a limiting factor, and then we thought what well, we could do, hopefully, we could do something useful. So we've, we've advanced quite a bit of work on decision-making. In practice, it's cashed out as quite a lot of leadership training, leadership development, residential work with uh, decision-makers, that kind of thing. And in a moment, I'm going to tell you some of my reflections having done that work. So Richard, this is where I describe your, uh, this is where I describe your world. Um, but before we get to that, I'm going to get you to try to guess at some of the contents of what we do, what I'm going to present to you. You've arranged yourselves reasonably neatly so this ought to be possible. I'm going to get you to just work with your neighbour or in groups of three or something like that. I'm going to give you questions to focus in on and I'm going to give you like a minute to do it so you're going to get no time whatsoever. Um, I do quite a lot of facilitation stuff and one thing that I've realised is um, I have a particular form of shyness. So like, this is okay, standing here talking is not hurting me particularly in any way. But what I can't do is call groups of people back when they're talking. It's actually just not within me. Um, so to remove that problem from my life, I bought a bell, I went on eBay, um, it cost me six quid, and it goes everywhere with me now, but it doesn't come to London with me. I forgot to bring it. Um, so I'm not equipped with a bell, but I'm gonna have to stand here and just like impotently clank at my glass 
when I'm doing that, know that every moment you carry on talking is causing me some sort of psychic injury. So, no, so now you're going to help me, okay? That's the way this is going to work. Okay, so you're going to turn to your neighbor. I will time it. Um, I'm going to give you a minute on this question, the first question. This ought to be easy for you, come on. So um, reasons why NHS leaders ought to be commissioning and using rapid evaluation. So you have a minute with your neighbor, go. I got a bottle which I thought was an upgrade. It's worse than the glass. Okay, I'm gonna, we're going to use the glass. Okay. Um, nice, thank you. I'm not going to ask you for feedback. I should have told you that. Um, the second question I'm going to give you then, um, maybe more of an act of imagination and maybe we all turn to Richard. Ways in which people make progress up the NHS career ladder. So what do you have to do if you want to become successful as a leader in the NHS? Uh, you have a minute. Go. Um, okay, the, um, the final one then. So we've done, um, what have we done? We've done reasons why leaders should commission and use rapid evaluation. We've done ways in which people make progress up the NHS career ladder. Your final minute? I want to know the Venn relationship between these two things. Okay, you've got a minute, go. Let me, uh, let me have you back then. Okay, thank you. Um, useful. I want in the Q&A, if people have spotted much of an overlap between those things, I am very interested to know. So that's, I'm partly priming you for a set of suggestions that I would, I would like to gather. Um, I'm now going to offer you a few reflections. I'm going to offer you three characteristics of 
of, of the local decision makers environment. I'm going to describe it in three, three different ways for you. This follows from work I've done. Some of it has been interviews with, but a lot of it has just been like hands-on work and being in the room with leaders. So this is my take on, on their world. Um, so what do I think characterizes the local um, decision makers environment? Um, the first thing I would say is that it's a world of constraint. Um, the decision makers that we uh, work with a lot at the local level will describe a feeling of being hemmed in. Um, of having very little room for manoeuvre, very little space for imagination or to do things differently. And the factors that would cause that, the sort of sides of the box, um, uh, regulator behaviour, uh, resource constraint, workforce constraint, um, local relationships, everything coming marked urgent, that kind of thing. So it's a world of constraint. That's the first characteristic, I'd say. Again, I mean, it sets the context for rapid evaluation. We were hearing it this morning. So a world of constraint, also a world, I would say, of ambiguity. Um, a world of shifting sands, a world of fog, a world where people are describing uh, incredible variance in decision-making practice with no apparent relationship to the nature of the decision being taken, um, and it being not completely obvious what better or worse quality decision-making would look like. So, so a world of ambiguity alongside this world of constraint. And then the final thing that has occurred to me sort of more and more as we've done work with decision makers is that there's a sort of, um, there's a kind of a, like a gravitational pull, a sort of black hole type pull. This is awful, I'm sorry. Um, towards, <laughs> towards the status quo. It's that, it, that it's very, very difficult. I mean, I actually got to one point where I was surprised that anyone would make a decision. Because if, if you think about the, the asymmetry and incentives that decision makers face, they are horrendous and they're stacked in the wrong way. If you make a decision, you've made a, a visible and deliberate act, you've kind of put your head above the parapet, and you're going to get called on the results. If you don't make a decision, things just are as they are, and they can be suboptimal from everyone's perspective, and it kind of doesn't matter because you've not done it. If you make a decision and it seemed to go well as an NHS leader, as far as I can detect, the sort of greatest upside you might achieve is um, a retirement gig and a carriage clock. I mean, there is no, you're not going to get rich for several generations, are you? Um, but the downside of getting a decision wrong is losing your job. So the way the incentives are stacked is completely asymmetrical and completely in the wrong way as far as, uh, as, far as we, might, we might wish. So that, I think, is what characterises the, in very brief terms, um, the local decision-maker environment. I want to push on a little bit and see what rapid evaluation might do in that context and how it, and I want to invite you into saying how we could help to make things better for these poor people. Um, so again, here was the, here's the strategy unit basic theory of change, you know, better evidence plus better decisions ought to give us better outcomes. It's our theory of change, but it, it must also be, if you boiled it, the basic theory of change for all rapid evaluation for our analytical work of that type. So what are we interested in? I mean, of course, we heard this morning, of course we have to be interested in the game of better, projection of better evidence. We have, if we're in the supply of analytical insights, we have to get better at doing that. That's, that's without question. Um, you will join me in not wanting to have an existential look at the uh, bottom part of that equation. I'm sure it's just got to be true on one level. So what can we do? As a, as a group of people, as a community of people, interested in supplying insights to decision makers, what scope do we have to help them with their decision making processes? What can we do in the way we act, the way we conduct our studies, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to help improve the decision making process and to enter the decision making world a bit more? Um, I've got a few little prompts here, but I, but I want you thinking on this question, and I want you to tell me. And actually, I'm trying to subvert the form. I get you to give the presentation, and then I tell you the questions I want. I want from you. Um, so, what could we do here? Here's my half go at it. By design, can we set up our evaluations such that decision-making processes are designed in, so that we are matched to decision-making processes? Can we find allies in decision-maker world that want to hang around with evaluators? Can we make the best of, of that community? Are we left beavering and badgering with people? Are we trying to kick the side door down? One mode of rapid evaluation has got to be that you help decision-makers to think evaluatively. Is that what we can do? Um, but I'm, very, I'm mainly interested in the Q&A if, if people have got thoughts and suggestions as to how we as a community supplying this stuff can help the decision-makers that we're there to serve. So uh, that was me. Thank you. Please. Thank you. So yes, please hold those thoughts as. Uh, Sorry.
let you do your own slides. <laughs> You're getting instructed, yeah. So this is my partner in crime, <laughs> Joe Dumble, very senior investigator for NIHR and uh, co-director of... really old, very senior. Very senior, very senior. <laughs> Not quite as senior as me. Uh, but uh, co-director of Reval Rapid Service Evaluation Team and uh, a very extensive uh, research uh, portfolio across all aspects of applied health research. So, Joe. I'm repeating, I'm repeating it's all right, I'll show it to you. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. It's really uh, lovely to see everybody. So, I'm going to talk very briefly about uh, a rapid evidence synthesis product that we've developed. Um, in Greater Manchester, uh, and this is part of our work in our applied research collaboration, so in ARC, which is NIHR funded. Uh, and this is work that lots of people are involved in, not just me, uh, although I've only put my name on the slide. So very quickly, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a brief overview about our thinking and the reasons why we decided to develop another rapid evidence synthesis process or product to try and mobilize knowledge to inform decision making. Um, so a bit of a rationale and then I'm just going to very quickly walk through what this looks like, just show you um, how we put one together and what the final output looks like at the end of it. So uh, as we've heard today, I don't think anyone here would disagree that um, we want decision about decisions that affect health and how, how health and care are delivered to be uh, informed by evidence. And decision makers also want evidence to shape decision making, but there are lots of challenges in that. So we work in Greater Manchester with a number of stakeholders, especially within the health innovation networks, but also more widely within uh, ICSs, so within the integrated care services, and also in combined authorities. And there are a range of people who know that evidence might be important to decision making, but, but getting it in a timely way is problematic. So we recognise issues with getting evidence to people in time, but more broadly, there are also challenges around building the relationships around which we develop and produce the right evidence that people want to inform decision making. And we've heard today that partnership and working together are really, really important. And the danger is that if we don't get these things right and produce useful evidence for decision makers, then the ship sailed. And we've heard this, we miss opportunities. So I'm going to think today specifically about producing evidence for decision makers that are reviews. So evidence syntheses that bring together information to inform a decision problem. Lots of other types of evaluation and research but we know that reviews can be really, really useful, really important in this space because they bring together lots of relevant information, hopefully, in a, in a, in a way that summarises information for people usefully. And in this space, systematic reviews obviously have huge value, but we know that they take a really, really long time to produce. There's lots of talk about things getting faster, because of um, automation and machine learning. But still, uh, my experience certainly of systematic reviews, if you do one in less than a year, you're doing pretty well. And there are other rapid review products um, which can take a month to a year. But actually, again, in my experience, even rapid reviews can still be fairly slow. So we developed, working with stakeholders in Greater Manchester, a, a rapid evidence synthesis process to try and mobilise knowledge for decision makers in a, in a review product that ideally can take um, two weeks. Although, in, in all honesty, some do take longer, up to a month, depending on the size and scope, and also the timelines that decision makers are working to. Um, so I've put down the side that there's obviously a compromise in terms of speed and rigour, uh, and we've already heard a lot about that today. So what are we aiming for when we do this? So we say we're aiming for something that's good enough. It's aiming to inject useful evidence in the decision-making space to allow that decision to be evidence-informed. It's not a product that will make recommendations or that it would be anticipated would be the sole 
source of information that would be guiding a decision that's often very complex, as we've had. But we say something that's good enough, and by good enough we mean that it's up to date. It includes evidence that's relevant and has methodological rigour, and it's presented transparency so that uncertainties and limitations in the work are acknowledged. Um, and so uh, we try and present the, the information openly. And it does require, I'll, I'll mention this again, but it does require a fair amount of skill in terms of um, having experienced reviewers to do this. So this is just a bit of a placeholder to make this seem slightly less abstract at this stage, and I will go through it. But this is just a shot from our website. We've done about 38 of these so far, uh, and these are just some of the areas that have been covered uh, by these rapid evidence synthesis uh, reports that we've done. So just very briefly to think a little bit about uh, how we do them. So the first stage of a rapid evidence synthesis process is identifying uh, the in innovation, the initiative, uh, sorry, the innovation or the intervention. And I should say here that this model is very much anticipated to be uh, a product or a, a process that is integrated with the system. So rather than being a team that stand outside and come in when this is when this sort of review is needed and then step out again. We're wanting this to be something that is us working with stakeholders in a continuous way to respond to uh, evidence needs and be able to mobilise relevant knowledge. So we work very closely to try and co-design um, elements of the review by identifying key features of the innovation and essentially developing a PICO like you would in a normal review, but doing that quite quickly and in quite a focused way. And that involves relationships with people who we work with on a continual basis. We then have a process of developing questions, as you would do in, in most reviews, but there's a, there's a sort of hierarchy to them. So we start with a narrow question, which is very much focused on the innovation of interest or the intervention of interest um, or the area of interest. And then we expand out to wider category questions. And it's probably uh, easier to see this, or as I say see it, I'm not sure it's hugely clear. But this is just an example from... Um, uh, a res, a rapid evidence synthesis, which outlines a bit about the innovation. So in this case, it's a very specific kind of device, which is relatively straightforward, but it can be done for much more complex interventions. We have ways of dealing with that. Um, and then the tables here, you can see the questions start off by thinking specifically about evidence for the innovation, then expanding out to try and provide as much useful contextual information to decision makers around what about innovations like this and then also what about innovations that try and do something similar as the one that you're most interested in and we won't necessarily answer all the questions but we'll work through until we get to a point of having evidence relevant even if it's indirect to the main <coughs> decision problem uncertainties that are driving the work. So we then have a searching process. It's, as you can imagine, curtailed compared with something like a systematic review. But we do search Medline, and we search um, the Cochrane Library, and a lot of nice resources. And there's a lot of bibliographic searching. In terms of study selection, so the, the big note here is that we initially will focus on evidence synthesis, so existing reviews. So the type of study design will be dictated by the question, so we can do questions around effectiveness and um, diagnostic accuracy and occasionally prognosis and also uh, experiential and acceptability questions. And obviously the study designs of interest broadly will be tailored to those questions, but we search initially for systematic reviews. If we can't find relevant systematic review data, we're not happy with the quality of the existing reviews, or they only partially answer the question, we'll then move on to primary research. Again, trying to take quite a stepped and measured approach to do this as quickly as possible, but trying to summarize the most relevant evidence for the, the questions that are driving it. In terms of critical appraisal, we do do this if we, including Cochrane reviews, we tend to um, trust that as a, a good source of evidence, as a, uh, an output with high validity, um, but we will conduct risk of bias assessments on primary research 
or systematic reviews where we're less uh, certain about the processes that have been used. And we do uh, conduct a grade assessment in a, a kind of a rapid way, but uh, I'm not going to talk about that here just because of time. And then we synthesise the evidence, either drawing together the findings from reviews that we found, or where we've included primary studies, we tend to present it as a narrative synthesis, um, and we wouldn't often anticipate having to do uh, a meta-analysis. So I've just put on our website here um, where we have most of the reviews that we've done available. You can see here that we're very clear that this isn't a systematic review. It comes with a disclaimer about what this rapid evidence synthesis does and doesn't try and do. It's very much a tool to feed into decision-making processes rather than being something that's absolute. Uh, again, um, this is some examples uh, of reviews that we've done, and they're all live, so you click down on them, and when you do that, you will see, uh, this is an example of uh, a review that we did for virtual wards, and it has a summary at the start of it where we try and really um, summarise as, as pithily as we can some of the key findings from the review, and these are also presented to the people who commission the review essentially with the slide set and also we tend to have a discussion session so a feedback session so it's both written and verbal uh, this is the front end of the more detailed report that sits behind that summary uh, and then there's a again a, a sort of a, a version of the summary but the reports tend to be 10 to 15 pages long so there is a sort of a full breakdown of what we found but it is try to to we do try and feed it up into something that's a bit more digestible, uh, but that's an ongoing process because, as we heard this morning, trying to make our findings as, uh, as easy to understand and as clear as possible is an ongoing challenge. So for a lot of reses, that's, that's what we do. We feed them back. We have ongoing conversations with our stakeholders who we work with. Occasionally, we do do work that then continues on, in this case, into a broader rapid review and then into a more detailed systematic review. So some of the res topics that we work on because of the activity that's going on locally and sometimes regionally, we can see opportunities, again, through the arc to extend the work to try and add a more... Um, comprehensive or a, a more um, detailed exploration of the evidence that's useful both locally uh, and hopefully nationally. So we're still we're doing this a lot. It's been well received locally with good feedback, but it is, a, it is an interactive process uh, and hopefully will continue to be embedded into local decision-making processes. Um, it's been great for developing spaces where we can have uh, conversations more generally about research with the people that we work with locally to try and have those researcher policy maker spaces to talk about research and its value. Um, and just a few of them, not challenges, but the things that it's reliant on is um, there's a lot of process that sits behind it and we do need incredibly experienced reviewers to do it. Thank you. There we go. So our next uh, speaker, Louise Gosami, is, um, has a very high-end job, I think, because uh, a lot of rapid evidence synthesis, systematic review, and everything else like that needs an infrastructure in place for, for, for the researchers to be able to synthesize evidence in the way. So uh, Louise is head of uh, knowledge and library services for NHS England, and is gonna tell us a bit about the infrastructure that sits behind uh, what, Louise, uh, what Joe's just talked about. So Louise. So I'm not a researcher, I am a genuine bona fide librarian uh, and proud to be so and have been for very, very, very many years. Um, what I want to do today is uh, talk a little bit about what we do nationally as NHS England and the sort of national leaders for knowledge and library services out in the NHS and also talk a little bit about what um, the local knowledge specialists can do for you because actually they're the, they're the real heroes. We just sort of set, we just set the stage and they're the ones that are delivering on the ground. Now I'm going to use the clicker and I'm trying to try not to break it, so we'll, we'll, give, we'll, give, we'll give it a go. So a little bit of context. Um, 
Health and Care Act came in in 2022. Um, it continues to place a statutory duty on both the Secretary of State and therefore anybody who works in the NHS, as well as uh, integrated care boards, that actually you should be facilitating and promoting the use in the health service of evidence obtained from research. And for us as, uh, as information professionals, that's been a great hook to hang things on because it's helped us make our case in terms of service provision. We uh, were previously part of Health Education England. We are now part of NHS England. And we've got, um, as an organisation, it has a specific role to support local decision making so that uh, local NHS leaders make the best decisions for their local populations. So we sit within workforce training and education and we get a token mention of knowledge within the mission of um, workforce training and education. But actually, the remit of knowledge and library specialists out there in the system isn't just for the education of the workforce. It's for the business of the NHS and making sure that they have the evidence to be able to make the, uh, the appropriate decisions and deliver the business. Um, and uh, you heard from Thea this morning about the long-term workforce plan. It's a very high, hot topic within NHS England. Um, and... Um, there's a role that we have to play underpinning the fact that we want the workforce with the right skills. We want them to be able to know where to find the evidence to make the decisions. So there's a pivotal role that we have to play there going forward. So in terms of what we do, um, we are the national leads for knowledge and library services out in the NHS in England. I know there are other people here from other home nations. There are mirror bodies across the country. So I've got colleagues in Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland. Um, who deliver similar services. We set this out in, under the umbrella of our strategic uh, framework, which is knowledge for healthcare. And what that does is it sets the ambition for local NHS knowledge and library services so that we can try and provide a more consistent experience to NHS staff across the system. And basically, at the risk of showing my age and sh sounding like a martini advert, it's about having the right evidence in the right place at the right time. So those of you that are too young will gloss over that quite quickly. So, oh, they've gone orange, that's lovely. So what do we do as a national team? Uh, part of what we do is we make sure the services out in the system are of sufficient high quality so that that environment is appropriate, you've got the appropriate staffing levels, the quality is there. So we have a set of essential criteria that we ask um, local services to adhere to, but we also have service improvement conversations because what we're doing is we're trying to stretch the service and grow the model of service. Um, out in the system. What we also do is make sure that we have the, our staff have appropriate skills. So that's the summarising, the synthesising, the softer knowledge mobilisation skills, um, because it is a small but perfectly formed workforce within within the NHS. But what we also do is we make available e-learning for the wider healthcare workforce in terms of thinking about literature searching, thinking about critical appraisal, thinking about knowledge mobilisation, but also thinking about those health literacy conversations you have with patients, actually really checking that they do actually understand um, what they're being told, because often default is, yes, of course I understand. Um, so our offer out to the system is to skill our workforce, but also to skill the wider workforce um, in, in, in terms of those softer information skills. Um, one of the key pieces of activity we do is actually we purchase on behalf of the system the evidence that underpins quite a lot of the rapid evaluations that you've already talked about this morning. So, um, and we do that because frankly it's cheaper. Uh, we've also developed a more seamless front end, so if you move from organisation to organisation what you see is similar. And it also, we've tried to grow the amount of content that we make available so that if you went from this trust here to that trust here, you can kind of get, kind of hope that you're going to get access to the same kind of evidence. But also what we're trying to do is look at what the technology can do. Can we embed clinical decision support tools into electronic patient systems so that actually at two in the morning, if you need it, you can have it or you've got it as an app on your phone. Um, all of this we're trying to do to, to help people be able to have access to the evidence when they need it. Um, and um, by doing this, we're saving on a per annum about £6 million a year 
to, um, to the system by doing it once and we're saving a shed load of time of procurement teams trying to work out how they buy it locally. So we want to do more of that going forward. But so basically what we do is that content is there, it's there for people to use um, and um, it's, it's a more equitable offer for everybody, whether you're in primary care, mental health, secondary care, it's there for you 24 seven. I think we can all agree that my colours have gone a little bit weird, but anyway, um, that healthcare is a knowledge intensive sector. The, the, the scale of growth of the evidence base is rising exponentially. So back in 1950, it was said medical knowledge would double every 50 years. Fast forward to 2020, every 73 days. Best will in the world, nobody's going to know everything. What you learn at medical school, what you learn when you're trained to be a nurse, frankly, is going to change and evolve. And what we need to be able to do is distill that information for people to help them make the decisions. And this is where knowledge specialists come into play. So um, we did some work with Health Economist um, because everybody likes to know return on investment, value for money, blah, 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 all of that kind of stuff. You can tell I work for a corporate organisation. Um, what we did was we worked with them and we looked at service provision more generally and what we discovered was for every pound that you invest in knowledge and library services, you get a £2.40 return on investment. It's not savings, it's an economic benefit. Just have to say that little caveat there. Um, but what we also did was we then looked at um, the knowledge specialists themselves, where they were working within teams, whether they were doing, when they were doing the rapid summarising, synthesising and distillation of the knowledge. And that return on investment actually goes up to £3.85 for every pound invested. So it's good value for money. We're often a soft target. But actually what we're trying to do is give the gift of time and improve productivity. I know that's the buzzword of the moment. Um, but actually we need to put, we need, you know, we need, we need to say more about that because actually what we're trying to do is save you time because our knowledge specialists are a shed load cheaper per hour than a consultant. Go figure. Um, we have 174 NHS knowledge and library services across the country and there's about 630 qualified knowledge specialists within that um, set of services. So um, I think that's quite compelling. So let me tell you a little bit about what they do. Um, so some of you might think, oh, well, it's all about the space and da 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 da, but actually it's not. It's about having somebody who's part of the fabric of the work that you do. So it's supplying the evidence base, it's searching for it, it's distilling it down and presenting it in a way that's acceptable that you can understand and you can distill and help you make those important business decisions. Um, what we're trying to also do though is grow the number of embedded roles. Um, I've already met somebody this morning who has the benefit of an embedded librarian and basically what they do is they're in your team, it could be a clinical team, it could be the senior management team, it could be the quality improvement team as per this example here. And what they do is by sitting and being part of a multi-professional team, they're likely to pick up the cues and go, actually, we can help you do this. Have you thought about this? Can we capture the learning for that so that we can make it available going forward? So basically, they become part of the fabric of the work that you do. And that gives you that richness in terms of they know they understand the work, but they also understand what they bring to the table. And it could be that they're looking at the evidence. It could be that they're looking at the knowledge mobilisation and the learnings, etc. So that's a key role for people to have. Um, going to finish shortly hopefully I haven't taken too much time part of what we try to do is um, often people go oh libraries it's that space it's those books it's those journals but actually part of what we want to do is show the impact of what we can do in terms of providing evidence the next couple of slides show a series of different types of contributions that knowledge and library specialists can make to the business of the NHS. So this one um, resulted in helping them secure £2.6 million for a digital exemplar programme. But this one's also about working with the senior management team so that you're providing a leadership update on a regular basis so that people can, you know, have content in a digestible format so that actually you can help uh, drive change but also save the time of the decision maker because that's the key piece it's that piece about actually giving the gift of time making people's life easier by giving them what they want in the format that we want 
Um, one of our challenges is we can talk about ourselves and how fabulous we are as much as we like, but actually sometimes we need some senior people to say how fabulous we are. And this is Mr. Rob Webster, who has been a very good advocate for us, actually, um, in time. And um, actually, in, and sometimes the two together, the impact case studies of the, how the evidence has made the difference and the advocacy is what tells the story of the value of knowledge and library specialists. So I will stop. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm going to push this microphone down the table because now we're further and further away from this end. And we'll just shout. Um, so we've got 10, 10 minutes-ish for questions. So Fraser raised some questions right at the start. I'm sure people will have some questions about the time or two as well. So uh, does anybody want to go first? Yes. Hi, I'm Philip Smith. I'm the um, head of... Research Innovation at the North Essex Concrete Care Board. And I'm really interested in understanding optimization and trade offs. So, if you want to use information or innovation to enhance or redesign a service, we have a number of constraints. And it seems to me that we have to try and work out what's the optimum allocation of resources within those constraints. So, for me, there is a challenge around optimization as much as there is about identifying potential options. So I, I'm, I don't know all the implementation issues, so I don't know if there's answers out there about optimization, but I'd welcome to you, I'd welcome any comments or feedback you have about that optimization. And of course, the question is what do you actually optimize? I'm going to start with you, Emma. <laughs> In terms of thinking about the rapid evidence synthesis in terms of, of these decision points that we have to address. I think for, for something as complicated as that, it would, so from, a, from a rapid evidence synthesis, I suppose I can wear different hats to answer this question, but from a rapid evidence synthesis perspective, um, it would need to be broken down I think into a, a series of different elements because there would be so many different component parts to it that would need uh, different exploration of evidence that would then need to be brought together I think because doing something trying to go be rapid and do something incredibly broad depending on the specific uncertainties or ambiguities or area where direction was required would probably be a bit of a false economy because it potentially be too broad. Oh, I, mean, I could uselessly say some words, but I don't really know. <laughs> it's not my area. Hi, yeah. Hi, uh, Axel Kane at Chile University in Lancashire. Um, thanks very much for inter really interesting things, uh, presentations. Um, I think one of the issues, and I think Fraser hinted at that, um, is we, we still have to actually make evaluations um, accessible. There are loads and loads of doctors who come to me, who come to my colleagues, and they're saying, um, and this goes to what Louise also said, um, I just want to find a solution to this problem. Uh, I've got an evaluation, or I've got a quality improvement project here, how do I do this? What do I do? This? And also, as, as 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 Joe said, how do I do this quickly? Because I gotta have a result for it. We as academics are fairly possessive about this thing as well. We actually develop these wonderful kind of schemes and models, etc. They're not accessible anymore. I have a wonderful colleague in Netherlands. She did a developmental model of something. Uh, I think it had 50 domains and 150 items you had to go through. Who, who, which nurse or doctor can still do that when they have to deliver something on a daily basis? It's ridiculous. So we really need to democratize evaluations and rapid evaluations, of course. There's not a single master's degree, degree program in England on service evaluations. That's a shame. We are, we are one of the biggest uh, universities here, sits here in Manchester and others. Um, 
uh, we, we're still not delivering anything for NHS staff on the front line. And I think we need to do that very quickly. And Louise speaks to that, of course, you know, um, making it more accessible, making it, making it more um, uh, easier for everybody to do. Hi, um, I'm Bill Carroll. I work at the Research Consultancy SQW. Um, yeah, I just had a quick question about the rapid evidence synthesis. Um, and one of the things you mentioned about it being, you know, an element of it, it has to be up to date. And just thinking about the challenges in, in conducting reviews, particularly in relation to kind of innovation, is how quickly evidence becomes out of date. So just wondering, um, have you ever used uh, a rapid evidence review to kind of either repeat or refresh on a specific topic um, and, and what the process involved, if so? Hello. Um, so the short answer is no, partly because they're produced so quickly, ideally to dovetail with the points that the people that we're working with need it for the decision making. But it's a really good point because often these decisions have long tails um, and so that would be something that could be useful. But we've never been asked to do that. But it's a really interesting point. I think the closest we've come to it and it, but it is different is um, where we've a bit like the virtual wards example that I showed where because of ongoing interest or a more national focus and specific areas of uncertainty that require deeper exploration we've rather than repeat evaluations we've expanded the scope and and gone for a, you know a systematic review methodology to answer the, the broader questions. Uh, I'll just have a quick go at Bill's question and then come to Axel's. The, um, I once got asked to do, um, to provide the evidence for, it was Public Health England then, the question was something like, um, how useful are pedometers, or what are the effect, what's the effectiveness of pedometers? And even just saying that out loud now, in I mean, it just shows you how ridiculous the question is, doesn't it? Because tech moves so quickly. So the answer now would be, what's a pedometer? <laughs> Um, I, I don't have anything to add, Axel, apart from clapping. I mean, I, everything you said, I would just, I would endorse. The only thing maybe I would push on is to say that your colleague, who I'm sure is also wonderful, who's produced a 50 domain model that all you have to do as a busy nurse is read and comprehend, is probably lacking in imagination and empathy. That you know, I would say that the the margin that we might want to push on is is that of imagination and empathy, such such that we can enter the busy world of these people and be as useful as we can to them. I just want to pick up on the fact that there's a lot of researchers in the room here, but there's also, it's the what's the definition of research, and we heard this morning about what becomes quality improvement, what becomes knowledge mobilisation, and actually sometimes it's about distilling it down. It's not necessarily always about the full systematic review, it's about what can we do with the time that we have available and how do we make that easier? And that's where people like the knowledge specialists come into play to help you shape that thinking. So um, it's, 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 degree, it's, it's degrees. I mean, you're absolutely, you know, if you want best evidence, systematic review is the way to go. But we all know that busy clinicians don't have the time to process that or think about that unless they're going to be dedicated researchers. Sorry, there are, there are some questions that need a pushback as well. We were once asked by a central government department um, who were in charge of the money about the relationship between spending money in social care and unplanned admissions in health care and can we have the results in four weeks. And you go, well, that's a decade. That is a post-war length problem that you're asking us. To, so some questions you can't have. Your, you can't have your answer in four weeks. Can we? But we could, with more time, we can give you something useful and sensible. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if I've actually got a question. I think it's more of a comment. Um, but it was about going back to the title of this session, um, which was making evidence-based decisions, context and opportunities. And I feel like we've covered a lot on opportunities. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And I'd quite like to go back to context, context in which the evidence is generated and what we do with it, and the context in which decisions and decision-making processes are developed and acted on. And so I guess I'm just looking for a bit of a response and some thought on the role that context, whatever that is, plays in this whole process. I feel it's a bit negated at the moment. Hi, 
Hi, so I'm Ruth. I'm in uh, the Bristol North Somerset South Gloss Integrated Care Board. Um, sort of a comment, or do you agree with me? I really like Fraser's point about people thinking evaluatively, and I like. I was thinking about the term better logic, of like you've got your better, your three. I feel like a lot of the decisions are not necessarily logical because people are asking the wrong questions. So if we can teach people to think more logically and evaluatively. Is do people agree with me on that? And I think for decision makers, say where I work, to be braver, it feels like they want assurance that they have used the evidence. And you were saying, I, I recognize that kind of people not making decisions because they're afraid of getting it wrong. So how do we think creatively about giving them the evidence? And I like the fact the ARC's doing these rapid synthesis. My team does some, but I think they're not robust. So can we, is that happening across the country? That's a question. So I could keep talking. <laughs> Yeah, I can make a start because it's a big, big, big topic. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess I was just trying to think about, again, wearing different hats and, and draw together some strands. And I think it kind of echoes some of the things that were talked about this morning on the panel that certainly um, within health systems and other places where decisions are being made, it's busy and pressured and I think that people want to use evidence but that that's very challenging because I don't think it's a linear process and I think I'm very guilty and I'm trying to evolve as a researcher of seeing it as being something that's linear when it's not. It's cyclical and it's messy and people have lots of drivers that inform their decisions that are heuristic and emotional and uh, you know leaning to Fraser's point about you know your job and so it's a really complex context within which we're trying to mobilize knowledge and but we do it and we can do it and I think it's partly um, and I, I sort of think it's a fifth R because everyone's talking about rigor and rapidity and all those things that are really important. And I guess I increasingly see in some of this rapid synthesis, but also in doing the rapid work we do for Reval, and I, I don't know if others would agree or disagree, but I think it's about relationships. I think it's about taking the time to work with people and jointly develop a kind of research think and appreciation for research that in this non-linear, messy space, there's the opportunity to show where it's valuable without being too precious about, you know, um, you know, the risk of bias and this is terrible, don't even look at it. You know, that's, that's, that's not what we have to be about in that space. So I suppose contextually, I'm just trying to, trying to build relationships. I love research think. Oh, thank you. Um, the context, my, my summary of the context would be that we're over-stimulated and over-centralised. That would be one way I would try to summarise that. And I think if, if, you, if you accepted that, you might then get a logic that comes to you that is not, not research logic, but is political logic. So the way you would then observe people operating in that kind of system is, is with a logic that makes perfect sense in its own terms, but is not a logic that researchers might want to promote. Um, so promoting research think, that might be the, that might be the answer. I want to talk about the ICS situation. One of the things that we're trying to do is look at what's the model of service that we need to provide from knowledge and library service perspective across that broader footprint because we know we're not in a position necessarily to grow the amount of people that we have doing the work but actually what we want is the local services that you can draw on to work in a more collaborative way and that would then give you people that you could draw on to help inform that evidence-based decision making that you're that, that's that's challenging. Let's just finish off with a nice round of applause for some very... <laughs>